Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 24th of April. April has gone so fast, I think. But anyway, I don't know what that always means when people say that. But it um, it is April 24th, 2013. And um, we have Forage 4 with us. We have Ed Martinez and um, Fred Minlin. Um, and they talked to us a couple of times about uh, Forage 3 and um, one of their best people giving them feedback was Kelsey Shellhart. So um, I looked Kelsey up and we invited her back to uh, give you guys a hard time again. Not really. To give you guys a thought. Get lots of good, um, good hard questions. We're also um, throwing this in the context of this show in the context of Connected Learning and the NWP's Connected Learning Inquiry Group which, like all things, you know, people come, people go. We're kind of figuring it out. But here we are tonight, so we'll have some fun tonight. So we want to make some connections with um, with how the work you guys are doing out there in Santa Cruz. Is that right? Do I have the right city? We're in Santa Cruz County, and we actually have projects going in three different cities in the county. Okay. So um, we're going to... Just to back up just a little bit, Forage 3 was the pilot, was the first pilot, and we had 13 kids. The idea was to scale the second project up so that we could include maybe between 70 and 100 kids. So that Forage 5 will be maybe 100 to 200 kids. And then once we realized that we could do that many, then we realized that we could make the project scalable upwards to wherever we wanted. So this is the second forage series in it. This is the second in a series designed as mock-ups for what we hope will be a national program. Very so we cool. We started with thirteen. And, and and now we've got seven. So that's a that's a, that's a great um, once. I hope. Everyone will stay tuned and hear some of it. I wanted to, I did want to try to establish the theory, and the theory has something to do. I mean, the theory that we're proposing here, and it has to do with connected learning, and it has to do with connected learning being productive production center. Um, and Joel, can I call on you or Jennifer to kind of uh, spell out what that means, and then we'll get into the details of what you guys are doing. And you'll tell us whether you're actually doing that or not. That's fair. Joel sure. Miley is here, and, and Jennifer Wolven. I didn't even introduce introduce yourselves as you as you jump in here, if you would. All Joel. right. Uh, so yeah, I'm Joel Malley, and I'm a member of the Western New York Writing Project and an English teacher in Chittawaga Central. And we've been taking a look at this idea of connected learning and how that relates to the classroom. Uh, the theory is kind of that learning is most powerful when it has a number of different Different, uh, number of different facets, like that it's uh, connected to a community, that that community is kind of wide ranging, that the community can kind of come into the classroom, that the student has some sort of choice or agency in what he or she is studying, uh, that they are kind of creating it in a network of peers to also value the same thing, and that also that the uh, that the learning is about making stuff. It's about um, it's about producing, and that kind of depends depends on the content area, but in an English classroom it could be, you know, something is analog is a short story or as digital is a is a documentary. And of course it has, you know, many, many other different kinds of forms. Um, but it also it's kind of rooted in social justice and um, you know, making positive changes in our world. That's the other thing is that it um it gets at that idea of equity, connected learning, and the fact that, you know, um, that there's a certain fairness with which our society should operate, and that uh, we have a, you know, the most powerful modes of learning. Explore that and keep that in mind as we are making and creating and collaborating. Very cultural. I mean, what I love about what you just did is you put it all together, and often we pull the strands out, and they make less sense apart from each other. I think so. Very nice, concise introduction. Jennifer, you have anything to add or introduce yourself at least here and say, tell us how you're doing. <laughs> we can't hear you. We need you to unmute. There you go. So there we go. Okay. Yep, hi, hi, I'm Jennifer Wolfen, and I'm with the Central Texas Writing Project. Um, I teach in Austin, Texas. 
Um, and I I don't have much to add there. I think um, that that that's that Joel hit on it. Um, yeah, the the just the making, the collaborating. Um, I, I'm excited to hear what you guys are up to, what you're doing. As we all are, and we're going to have, have you hold one more second and have Scott and um, Kelsey introduce themselves. <laughs> Why don't we start with Scott and then Kelsey? Okay. Hi, I'm Scott Shellhart. I'm a freelance educator. Which means I work for free. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's in Indiana. I tutor a little bit. I'm a, a hacker, a maker, a uh, jack of all trades. And this is Kelsey. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> She's in eighth Kelsey, grade. Kelsey, you're, you're still in eighth grade, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you, know where, do you know where... Do you know where... I was going to just ask that. How are you planning your high school stuff? Um. Well, now we're picking out like what classes I'm going to be taking. I'm setting up all of my stuff, getting started for my whole high school thing, which is a little scary because eighth grade's not even over yet. So we'll see where that ends up. So you know exactly what school you'll be going to? No. <laughs> no, you don't. So what kind of choices are you facing? Um, I can either go to high school, like in the school system that I'm in now, just the one in town, or there's, I got accepted to Culver, which is close to here, but I, I don't know if I want to go there or not. And then there's another school, Northern Illinois, that I don't know what's going on with that one. I still have to finish the application and all that fun stuff. Cool. Well, they'll accept you once they see this, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. I mean, you used to hang out with us much more often, but um, as I said, I invited you on because you had such thoughtful comments to for Forge 3. Um, Fred, do you want to introduce the folks there, please? Let's um, yes. get going. And guys, you, I, three of you on the screen works, but remember to speak up. Um, into the microphone. If there were a microphone, that you could hand it to each other. All right, go ahead. Right. And then just uh, tell us what you're up to, and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep interrupting. Microphone, so I, I hope that's going to work okay. Um, I'm Fred Mindland with the Central California Writing Project based at UCSC, and my involvement with this project grows out of the uh, maker project of the National Writing Project, which uh, gave us a grant to begin this exploration, and then we got involved in the Third Space Project, which kind of grew out of um, Maker, which really focuses on involving the community directly with schools and having kids be involved directly with the community. And then I hooked up with Ed Martinez, who is a local artist, and have been developing the Forage project out of his own <laughs> art making. And together so, we and that was Forage 1 and 2, is that right? That was Forage 1 and 2. And okay. Forage 3 was our first collaboration where Ed recreated a similar project to his earlier Forages 1 and 2, but this time involving students in an after-school program at the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz. And um, we're now launching Forge 4, which is quite different in terms of the art content, but uses the same idea of community involvement around a uh, uh, essentially a social justice issue because it's, it's anchored in an environmental challenge that we have right here in uh, our Monterey Bay area. So um, I'll let Ed give a little more detail on that particular, but I also want to uh, introduce Dan Spels, who is a recently retired uh, high school teacher who's been working with us on the project, consulting on providing academic context and background and just helping out in general. Mm -hmm. So Dan, can you uh, bring yourself into the picture a little? You need to move, lean in a little. Scoot in here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Dan, what did Hi, you yeah. teach when you were, before you retired? Uh, world history, economics, government, U.S. history. Very cool. Yeah. I like, uh, so, go ahead. 
No, go ahead. You go ahead. Um, just uh, I'm I'm uh, exploring ways of uh, uh, using genealogy as a pathway into uh, um, students learning uh, history, and I'm also interested in developing uh, uh, ecological economics um, in a high school setting. So uh, uh, and. In both cases, uh, very easily, uh, uh, that kind of work uh, lends itself to uh, young people writing about uh, what they learn and what they think um, as uh, as as they discover. That's that's how I made my way into Central California Writing Project. Very cool. Welcome. Um, and Monica joined us. Welcome, Monica. And then. I, you know, my thing was that what I wanted to do was I wanted to wrap core academic values into a, the process of a working artist so that we could re-inject art as a social value back into the classroom where they couldn't cut it. And what I found was that we could take all of the academic topics, writing, chemistry, geometry, uh, engineering, and all the sciences, and incorporate those into art projects so that it would take those academic topics into a level where the kids could find relevance with what they were doing in the classroom. Okay. And, and Joel, um, I just wanted to come back to your definition, uh, which was, um, as I said, very clear. Um, I don't know if you did mention the academic side of it, but that is part of connected learning as well, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. In fact, Go ahead. Yeah, I was I was kicking myself. I'm like, I know I'm forgetting one, but uh, yeah, <laughs> one of the major, majorly important ones is that um, the, the production that we do, the collaboration that we do, uh, the networking we do, all has this, uh, you know, academic kind of, not a rigor. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily the right word, but that it is steeped in in academic topics and. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so it's very important. So and I think, I think we need that to tease, te go ahead, yeah, you're, I was you're doing say, I think what that I was one's say, for yeah. Joel and I, um, kind of is easy to overlook because we, as teachers, that's, you know, that's kind of a no-duh for us. Um, and I think a lot of the people we were meeting, um, at DML are, you know, they're, they're working outside of schools and so for them it, it maybe isn't quite the, the no-duh that it is for us. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, but as speaking as a teacher, also I also want to be open to re-understanding what that word means in this context a little bit too. But yeah, so so I'm glad you guys are using. I mean, as you were introducing your your uh, project, it was community based. It was production based. It was. Uh, you were talking about it connecting to core academic subjects. You were like, and and um, you were hitting all the all the uh, words there, <laughs> which is great. Yeah, um, yeah. But go ahead, Fred. Well, no, what I was going to say was right. that the idea was to say to the academic world that even if you're just a read and write and arithmetic person, here's a way for us to inject project based experiences back into the classroom where they really belong where they couldn't cut them because they could be made irrelevant which is what I think we've done with the arts in the schools for the last certainly 10 years maybe more maybe 30 years so we wanted to reinject that that, that my concept was to reinject that back into the classroom where the kids could look at, at artists like Leonardo da Vinci as not only an artist but a master engineer and a master chemist So let's get into it a little bit. Let's talk about what it looks like. <laughs> Can you take us to one place and one time and tell us what it looks like at that one place and time? Even though I know this is spread out over different artists in different communities, can you start us off with, with one story? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, do you want me to take, do you want me to take that? Yeah. Um, what it was was I'm a fisherman in Santa Cruz. And I've noticed over 20 years that the bait cycles have changed radically in the last five to seven years. And I said, here's a great way for me to use my art 
to start to launch a topic, to say, look, I don't care what, whether you call it, to, to speak even to the climate deniers, to say, I don't care what you call this, but something's really out of whack in the ocean and I want to have a conversation about it. Um, and what work we had, well, the first project was really through the Museum of Art and History, and it was really about my work. But it involved 300 people that had a piece of that, of my work, and many of them turned out to be kids, which kind of surprised us, uh, some as young as six. And what I found was that those kids really got it. They got, they understood because they could, when they were texturing one of the fish that were going into my sculpture, they got a, a, a completely different, uh, a hands-on, visceral way for them to experience that little animal. And it, it made them inquire about what was really going on with the topic that I was launching with my art. And then I met Fred, who does all of the things that I don't do well, which is like work with the system and do the paperwork and do the other stuff because of my, I'm also learning yeah. disabled. Yeah, that's and, how we think about Fred. We think of him as a real systems kind of guy. Yeah. Not, but go ahead. <laughs> no, but whack out. No, I, I, I understand what you're, you're saying. People though. Like, <laughs> like Fred and Dan, or I couldn't do the project. Because what mm -hmm. Dan, Dan and Fred's you know, help with this thing has done is it's freed me up to really work with the kids on the art, integrating those topics back in the classroom. And, and this is the second pilot that we've done within a school kind of environment. And we're finding it's really working. And we're, we're extremely excited about the response we've gotten, even at the early stage of Forge 4. A particular example, um, just to, to show the flexibility of the model, which I think is one of, one of the, its great powers here. Um, first of all, the, the idea is that rather than have kids doing sort of made up, dumbed down, make worky kinds of little chachki projects that they can take home, they're working with a professional artist on a real piece of art that is going to be displayed out in the community, um, and they're collaborating. So the, the idea of collaboration and the idea of having a meaningful product is, is crucial there. And in the Forage 4 uh, model, what we've done is to take advantage of the happenstance that Ed had access to a set of 15 4 foot by 8 foot panels from another project that he did. So we've distributed those panels to a variety of schools. And just to take a very concrete example, in, in one school, the, the Continuation High School that we're working with, we have three teachers involved. Um, in each case, the teacher felt that there was a particular piece of this art making that would fit with this particular piece of their curriculum. In one case, it's around exploring an, uh, an indigenous artist, a, a Mexican artist whose work really appealed to the students. So they'll be doing a painting based around the ecological and environmental themes that are the foundation of the project, but using that style of art to present it. Another teacher so, is a Quick, so quick questions on, on that, just a, a few more details. What what age are we talking there? And so that, the, these are high, the teacher, teacher uh, the high school on the theme. Go ahead. Yeah, we have we have a, one high school um, where we have three classes working. We have middle school with two different classes, and then uh, and uh, a homeschool alternative program that works with all ages. So those are the, the it's a very wide range of ages and school situations for the kids. These um, panels, what are they made out of? The four by eight plywood. foot panels. They're, they're plywood mounted with a with a rim so they can stand up. So they're set panels. Basically, I I hung an art exhibit and I built the set panels to mount the art, and they were donated to us by the O'Neill Foundation. Um, so I, I found myself in possession of 15 of these things, and they looked like 15 big blank canvases to me. And we were thinking about what we want, you know, we were thinking about 4 4 
And so rather make it rather than make it another piece of my metal work, I said, let's take it into a painting, let's take it take it into a completely other medium. Just to test it. So I was, Kelsey, uh, I, was, I, I just want to encourage you. Can I? Can I just even at this yeah. point? And I, I know I keep I always interrupt, but that's okay. Um, Kelsey, you have any any questions you want to start off here with, or are you just listening, or what are you thinking? Let me call on you. <laughs> I'm thinking that I get what you're trying to do with working art into the curriculum, and I think it's a really good idea because I like art. My brain just works like that. But I think it would be really tough to do, but keep up with all of the state standards and national standards, I think it would take a lot of work. It'd be hard to, like, you'd have to get the right minds together for them to make the connection and get the spark to move. Before you before you address that question, can you say more about my brain works like that? Do you think oh, no. you're unique or I don't know. I'm just kind of a an art. Uh, I can't even talk. I'm kind of an artsy fartsy kind of person. I I think I'm able to make the connections between more left brain stuff, right brain stuff. Uh huh. I'm with you, sister. That's Go me. ahead. Does somebody want to address that issue of how is, how are we going to be able to do this art and still meet all the standards? Is that a fair summary? Right. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the flexibility of making the connection and the ingenuity of the teacher in making those connections are, uh, I, I think, the keys here because we, we need to be able to both really, it, it, is, it is making um, unusual and unexpected connections that's really the, the, the key to um, learning. I, Ed often uses the, the phrase um, we need to do whatever it is to light up the kids. Well it's that lighting up, it's the, the making connections that I see as most, most exciting here. And yeah, it is a challenge. I, I, I just listened to uh, last, the recording of last week's discussion with Will Richardson, and he must have said at least a dozen times, this is really hard stuff to do. <laughs> and, you know, that's what we find. Yeah, it's a, it's a constant challenge and a lot of work to keep making those connections and showing that, yes, we can accomplish those academic goals as well as having the kids be excited, interested, and producing. Can I, mm -hmm. can I drop a, a note on that? This standards part of this thing is really interesting because I love to be surprised in this project. I'm lo I, I look forward to the teachers have constantly surprised us by they're driving the academic curriculum so that the and with what we found is that the program's malleable enough that we can just layer these this project onto what the teacher is doing so the standards will be borne out throughout the lesson curriculum that the teacher has already put in place. And so the teachers will be setting the standards and they're the ones that are going to be measuring the benchmarks at the end of the at the end of their classes and weighing the effectiveness and, and uh, accountability for that at the end, but they're all. We, one of the things that really has surprised us already was that one of the teachers decided that she really didn't want to participate so much in the art project, but she wanted to do it as a writing project around me as a, my process as an artist. And so they're not even really doing a panel, but they're yet they're working with that art project to create the student's writing, and it's really the student's story wrapped around my journey into where we're at in Forage Four. It's fascinating. So they're interview they're interviewing you, or how are they getting your story? Yeah, that's what they're doing, and it really surprised us because it was totally seamless. The integration was completely seamless. It was absolutely no problem at all. It didn't throw us for a minute. And then the third example, also from that continuation of high school, the, the third class is a social studies class 
where the approach that the uh, that the teacher developed in collaboration and consultation with Adam Dan was to ha have the art making be approached as a kind of collage project. So rather than having the class work all together to design a single piece, the students will be working on individual pieces of some of that governmental and regulatory background to the way this problem appears and the efforts that have been made to solve it. And then we will collage those uh, reflections of the students together. And the reflections of the students on Ed as artist and this project as a uh, as an approach to how do we reinfuse authentic learning into ordinary classrooms? That'll be a digital reflection that doesn't even appear in the panel making. If I can th thank the wonderful examples, want to introduce Robert Romano, or have Robert introduced himself? Um, this is one of the wonderful things that happens. We get to meet new people here. Uh, another, another, unless other people know Robert. Robert, do you want to introduce yourself? Welcome. Hey, I'm Robert Romano. What's up, guys? <laughs> what are you, are you a teacher or a learner, or how do you? Yeah, I'm a learner. I would, I would define myself as a learner. And how did you find us? Um, Hangoutsnitch.com. Okay. Okay, welcome. Um, so, um, and, and we want to encourage anybody to um, have uh, any kind of uh, questions as we go. Um, Joel or um, Jennifer or uh, anybody, Monica, do you have any thoughts, questions at this point you want to jump in on? I would just like to, uh, you know, just hearing that story about the different ways that your endeavor kind of gets involved in different schools, doing different things, and all the different incarnations that have resulted, like the different, you know, how your your project has manifested itself in different classrooms. I really like it. I think it's a, I think it's good evidence of what happens when we open the doors to outside. You know, outside people coming in, open up the you know our communities to the larger community, and um, I think that it, it was very dead on where you said that um, you know the teacher is responsible for coming up with the academic aspect of it, and then to see how you know this other opportunity, how how, how the artistic creativity proliferates through that. It was, it was a very interesting story to tell. Uh, I have this friend uh, with the Western New York Writing Project who is uh, this this poet artist Karen Lewis, who also is like an independent. Uh, teacher who comes into different classrooms and she just did this really nice project with the park school in Buffalo where she came into the school and she worked with the 6th through 12th grade and what they did was they went around the grounds and they created a field guide um, for their grounds so they described like all the different like they captured um, you know, all the different animals, all the different plant life, and by captured, I don't mean literally, I mean like, you know, <laughs> jotted down list of, and then they created this real nice field guide full of like student illustrations and poems, as well as, um, as well as a more uh, nomenclature, scientific, you know, little bird book type things <laughs> that, that you see around. So it was a really neat project um, where it had real world purpose, it's kind of like academic bent, rooted in the standards, but also, uh, you know, involved in artists coming in and, and doing their thing and, and, and kind of encouraging creativity is awesome. So that's just something I'm thinking about. Cool. Uh, I Kelsey has let us know that she has a question. <laughs> um, first of all, Joel, I think the field guide thing you're talking about sounded really cool. But my original question was, Ed, can you tell me more about what the environmental problem is that you're trying to spark the discussion about? Because I didn't really understand that the first time. Yeah. Well, on the east coast of the United States, you've got got the, the Gulf Stream that comes up the east, eastern seaboard, goes around the Atlantic Ocean and back down. Well, on the west coast, we have the Humboldt Current, which is a cold water current, and it brings all the nutrients down into the canyon. That feeds the whole web in, our, in the Monterey Bay Canyon. In the Monterey Bay canyon. Um, it feeds that whole food web, and for years, I fished for striped bass from the beach, and for the first up until about six years ago, I could almost set my watch to when the bait would start showing up. 
which would mean that the first stripers would be right behind him, right? So I kind of looked forward to about the first weekend of June when the bait would start showing up. And then about six years ago, it, what, it started what's getting the bait? Erratic. Sorry, what's the bait that shows up? That's a different fish or? Anchovies and sardines and jack smelt and all kinds I of stuff. Got it. Okay. So the predator follows prey. That's why we call it forage is because that's what the striped bass eat. So like a cow eats grass, the grass is the forage for the cow. Um, but so five to six, seven years ago maybe, those bait cycles started going off. They started being off, uh, they'd be way late, and then last, the year before last, they were way early, and then last year they didn't come in at all. I mean, for the whole season. They, I didn't even see it. So my expression with the first forage piece was to have a dialogue about that something's really going wrong with those migrations that had been so regular for the first 17 years of my fishing experience here and were now just completely off track. I mean, way off track. Badly off track. Does that, how's that? That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, well, and so one thing leads to another, and we kind of walk ourselves into an experience that I thought might be able to bring art and artists back in contact with the classroom where it would be integrally tied, so integrally tied to the core academics that they couldn't call it superfluous and then cut it, which is what they've been doing for a long, long time out here. I really don't have too much experience with them cutting the arts program because our superintendent and the principal at the high school are all really into music and the arts, so I don't really have experience with the arts getting cut, so I don't really know what that would be like. Well, it's bad. It, out, for a lot of schools, if I, I just put my son is now doing his first year in college, and for his whole school career, I watched the music programs would be the first thing to get cut. The art programs would be the first things to get cut. The, you know, even outside after school activities would be the first thing. So every time the budget got tight, the first thing they'd hack off is a music program or an art program or an after school program. I, for example, I didn't retire because I was tired of teaching or spent with teaching. The high school I taught at eliminated music, reduced the arts. We had um, over uh, three art teachers, and we reduced that to about one and a half. Um, we had one drama class. Uh, for This is for a school of 1,600 students. And these are, we eliminated a uh, uh, Mexican-American history class that was very popular. I mean, our school has been eliminating programs that I went to... Uh, uh, I mean, I taught at uh, Pajaro Valley High School. We've been eliminating programs that are popular with students because of, uh, you know, because of philosophical flows within education and because of budget constraints. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a great tragedy here on the West Coast and from what I understand um, across the country. You know, um, while you're while you're talking, um, Dan, um, earlier Kelsey had a question about genealogy and how that works into your classroom. So, um, you, yeah, uh, your elevator pitch on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, what I uh, when I uh, when I was working with students, I found um, I found at the start of the year. I would give particular assignments asking students to, you know, write their personal or family history. You know, sometimes students would say, gee, they don't really know much or so. And so then I would introduce the idea of historical fiction and they could create, um, you know, a, a history. But it, it gave me, uh, what I found was that I, I learned about the students and the students really enjoyed the activity. And, and the more I did that over the years, I, I consistently found that students uh, resonated and discovered interests and connections with history 
that um, eluded them, that were always out of reach when we were, or tended to be out of reach when uh, when we used a big textbook that was, uh, you know, focusing on events and personalities that um, that really the students experienced as abstract. I mean, I always loved it when a student would raise their hand and sort of uh, um, apprehensively ask me, "But Mr. Spells, how do we know? How do we know that what the textbook says is true?" And I thought that was an excellent question. And when uh, when I uh, when I uh, do genealogy, it gives us a chance to actually do historical field research where students get a chance to use, I mean, really primary source documents, you know, like census, uh, uh, census registers and birth certificates, all kinds of certificates, uh, obituaries, and, you know, lots of, uh, lots of ways besides journals and so forth. Lots of, so anyway, those are just ways that um, I found. I have found uh, students really, you know, once the door is open to a connection with their own personal experience, then you know a lot of uh, lights start going off um, about oh, you know, a flow of questions just start naturally flowing. Uh, naturally uh, coming to the fore and students tap energy they didn't realize they had for you know pursuing answers to those questions that's the uh, that's the uh, it, you know eventually once people start developing a, a sense of who their family members are then they start thinking about well gee you know this family member lived at this time and were preceded by these events and were affected by these conditions and contexts, and all of a sudden uh, they start appreciating what economics and geography and psychology and anthropology, all these uh, fields, you know, come into play in very uh, uh, interconnected, uh, integrated ways that students just naturally make a lot of connection about and then want to write about it. They want to write about it to each other, to family members, maybe to other people in their family, maybe to other generations uh, that are to come. I love that idea. That's and awesome. Interestingly, um, last week, uh, last week, last Wednesday, um, I went to this, the uh, Sutra Library in San, in San Francisco. It's a state library with lots of uh, genealogical resources. And I thought one of the, the, the head librarian there told the group I was with that, you know, most of, uh, most of, the, of what we have uh, on our shelves here as far as particular family histories was written by family members and donated. And my gosh, the idea struck me, and I think students would love this, students writing their own family histories and sending it off to the Sutro library, you know? I just, I, I just thought that would be a gas. Does that, that, does that sound interesting to you, too? That sounds really awesome. And you could incorporate arts, uh, all kinds of arts in there, and, you know, science. Uh, DNA has a lot of connections with genealogy. A lot of different environmental conditions went into the into play uh, as far as shaping uh, family experiences in different places. Uh, economics, uh, you know, has a big uh, big place in uh, people's decisions to migrate. So, so I have a way. I have a way to circle back a little bit, if I may. Um, and, and and it's this. Wait, um, and and it's uh circle back to Forage Four. Uh, well, first of all, let me just ask Dan: Are you how are you involved with Forage Four, or are you in in any way? I'm I'm uh, I'm volunteering. I'm wading into the Central California White uh, Writing Project, and I'm simply a uh, uh, you know a, a grip. A, a gopher, a, a, a <laughs> you know, much more than that's that. That's a great a thing to be. So a volunteer. I got it. I got it. Cool. 
So, uh, so one of the one of the things that I've been sitting here wondering, and it, it came up with Forage Three, and one of the themes um, and uh, that cuts through TTT, I hope, um, is is working with student passions, and that's in connected learning too. And you guys are obviously very passionate about the things you're doing, and you're sharing those passions with students. I'm just wondering again how that like where where the students individual passions come out and where because you're doing a collective project right so have you kind of messed with that do you understand my question oh yeah I totally <laughs> understand your question and here's the deal was that part of what my experience has been about over the last three years since I became on since I became re-engineered unemployed re-engineered um, was that I'm beginning to work with my what we used to call learning disability, right? And so I found that once I'm within that passion, that little slot where I'm really good at what I do, um, I get more excited about and I learn more about what I'm doing. And so what we're doing is we're working with every kid that we're that we're dealing with, and we're saying, look, it's our job to find that slot in every kid in that we work with, okay? So we, my assumption is, is that every kid that we're working with is a genius at something. And that mm -hmm. because they're kids, they haven't had really time on this planet to really discover that for themselves. So it becomes our job to comb that out and find out where these kids are geniuses and then feed it massively. So that's really what it's about. And once we find out whether it's drawing or the library sciences or the research or the engineering or the chemistry or the math or the music or whatever it is that's involved, we've created so many little slots that those kids can fall into that it's a tremendous gift to me as an artist to watch the kid find his slot and blow up on it. That's what it's, that's what it's about for me is that these kids have been said, have been told, that you're bad at this, or you're bad at that, or whatever. Or that you're learning disabled. Or that you're learning disabled, like I was, right? And I'm saying, I'm challenging that on a massive level, and whatever level I can, saying, look, we've all got challenges in some little area, but it doesn't mean that you can't locate your slot and drive it. And so we're just so, providing an opportunity for these kids to figure out where that slot is quicker and then we're going to feed it. That so Monica, I want to go ahead Kelsey, but uh, Monica I want to bring you in and because you've done some work uh, I think it was in the fall around big portraits with an artist or something maybe your reflections on on what it's like to work with an artist and getting kids yeah. passion. But Kelsey go ahead you had a thought. I really get where you're coming from on this because that's it's what I like to try to do is just find the things I'm good at and, you know, go with it. But I think it's good to be bad at stuff. People are allowed to be bad at stuff. Yeah, I'm bad at stuff. <laughs> what do you mean? Why is that good? Well, I agree with you, but explain. There's always room to learn something else. If you're good at everything, then there's nothing to do. You're just sitting there doing the same thing over and over, and while you're amazing at it, it has to get boring at some point. There's no room to expand and nothing to build on, and that's pretty much the fun stuff. Yeah, a couple of things that makes me think of are the, the, one of the things that grew out of the, the third space work and the conference in St. Louis around involving the community and involving uh, museum personnel in this work was how important it is to fail and to be able to accept failure. Um, and the other thing is is not coming on as a teacher who knows everything but rather as a facilitator and helper who maybe can point the students who are starting out in this exploration towards where and how they can find the resources to answer the questions that they have. I mean, we're starting at the core here, not with a scientific survey or a review of the literature, but with 
a, an artist who's a fisherman who has an observation about something in our local environment? Well, it, it seems pretty obvious that there, there's likely to be some climate change connections. There probably are connections to our local water cycle and the challenges around uh, around water supply and its use here and those are all things that we don't have the answers to either but we want to help kids in ex exploring and investigating and seeing what kind of connections they find. And one additional point is Kelsey we're not telling the kids stay within your easy zone okay but we what we're working with our kids what we're saying is is that we want you to, to take Something you really haven't you haven't been able to do in an academic world and and bring in other stuff that you haven't done yet. So we are taking them out. We're not saying stay within the safe zone. We're taking them out of the safe zone, but we're giving them freedom to do what really what they're really passionate about. That's where the question came. So we're not making it easy for them, but we're also giving them a space where they can try new things and not be called you're bad at that. Get it? I think too. Once you take it out of the school element, um, rigor is anywhere. I mean, school is where we get the the grade levels um, and the marking, and so we get the ma mindset that I can only take this certain art or whatever this far. And so once you get out of that mindset that we have of school, um, you could, I mean, Kelsey, you could find out something that you, you think you're really good at because we've graded you that way. You could take it so much deeper. I think of um, Daniel Coyle's um, The Talent Code and that deep practice um, to really become an expert. Yeah, and, so, and school is so se segmented, you never reach the state of flow. You can never get lost in what you do because every 40 minutes you have to go to a different room. So yeah. three things that I have been thinking about here. Um, first, uh, to a comment, um, Kathy Davidson wrote a great post, and she said in it that um, if there are no standards, are there any disabilities? Um, and you kind of referenced that. I threw a link in. Um, I caught David Mack um, speaking at a TEDx sure. today. And I think you guys will love, from what you just have talked about, you'll love his take on art and finding the thing that you can't not do and just really, you know, honing in on that. And then um, the third thing is Seth Godin's definition, and I'm sure a lot of other people's, but he's just the one that I followed a lot um, of art. And it is simply, it's not necessarily what we think of as art. It's the thing that you can't not do. Um, and I I love what you guys are saying and talking about. Um, my problem is, uh, well, um, Peter Gray just came out with his book, um, Free to Learn, and he's he's nailing so much. Um, Washer and M Majkowski just came out with Leaving to Learn. Um, there's so much unveiling of our pluralistic ignorance. I think we're going to free ourselves up pretty soon so we aren't tripping over ourselves trying to check off the boxes of did they get this and did they get that. I mean... Uh, life is too rich and full for us to be playing that game for, for yeah. very much longer. So, I just went through that with my son, you know, when he was in school. There was so much to that. And uh, that this whole project came out of sort of a rebellion on my part against the boxes that they tried to put my son in and check off his boxes. And when he didn't meet their expectations, they checked him off. And I had to fight that, and, uh, you know, because he's an exceptional student. And that's probably 95% of the people in the world that we're just writing off because they don't fit in that 5% box. And then we're exhausted because we're trying to figure out how to make them fit because we love them, you know, and that's just silliness. Yeah, that's, what, that's where this whole, the whole forage program started. That's, that's where it all came from. One of the one of the thoughts I had uh, when you again mentioned the word rigor, uh, Monica, and and I was reminded of a, a discussion we had in, in, at one of the writing project fora. I don't remember exactly which one about how 
rigor, first of all, it, it's such a horrible, restrictive word. It has that feeling of something binding you up. And I, I, I think the, the equivalent there, and yet at the same time, there is value in being clear and definitive about the facts of a situation and knowing what the reality is. But the word that we want is vigor. That's, that's really what we want to inspire in kids is that enthusiasm for learning. And again, it's not a matter of dichotomizing things in such a way that you discard the, the one that has the pejorative connotation, but rather you really meld them and use the, the opposition as a way to move a, a, a synthesis forward. Um, like the, the movement to add the arts to science, technology, engineering, and math, and instead of STEM, you have STEAM. So, the, the, because the arts are a crucial piece of even scientific work. So much of scientific discovery has come through what's essentially artistic inspiration. And I'd add to that if we want whatever word we want to call it, um, a five-year-old has that, you know, a, a one-year-old or younger learning to do some of the most amazing things have that. In Peter Gray's book, he's really addressing play versus work really well. Um, so it's not like if we, if we, you know, shake things up a bit, it's not like we have to figure out ways to get that into people. They have it. We've, you know... We gotta quit drumming it out. <laughs> yes, that's it. Uh, but um, I, I and I gotta I gotta always add who's the we in that sentence because it ain't just schools that's drumming it out of them. And in fact, schools are one of the places where they get to come alive a lot of times, and they get it drummed out of them in the jobs they have to have in the in the homes they live in and you know other places too. So uh, it sure. just feels to me well, that we need well, to keep the we big. Yeah. I, I agree, but school yeah. is the only yeah. place that is like mandatory, so it's not like a choice uh -huh. for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I agree that yeah. the we has to be all of us. Yeah. And I had a weird, a uh, uh, kind of off the uh, question. How did you become a fisherman? Um, I've always been a waterman. I grew up in Maine. Um, you know, and so I was always on and around the water. And to me, as a surfer and a, and a waterman, a sailor, a waterman, the fishing was just a, I found a place where I could go at sunrise and just be at that intersection where the water meets the earth meets the air. And there's always something about that intersection of the three elements that has been really um, almost sacred to me and so with me it's about being a fishing rod my dog and the possibility of uh, a large aggressive predator um, has always been kind of exciting to me and so to me Wait, my the, neighbor the fish is I, the aggressive predator what's yeah yeah striped bass are, are just excellent not only is it an incredible table fare so I would drag a 20 pound fish home and, our, and it would immediately go on to the barbecue, and the neighbors, they would see me cleaning a fish, and they would just start making food and show up, and the whole neighborhood would eat that one fish, and everybody goes, and nothing would be in the, would be in the freezer. So we would eat a fish that, you know, was so much tastier because it was just out of the ocean. Um, but it brought our whole neighborhood together every weekend evening, when I'd catch a fish, and I would come home, and they'd see me cleaning it, and I, after a while, I didn't even have to say anything. You know, Sylvie would make the salad, uh, Jeremy would bring the desserts, the you know, the and, and we and it would everybody gather around my barbecue on Fifth Avenue, and so it was a sociological thing as well because the not only did I have to have did I get to have that very private experience with my dog and I on the beach, but the fodder from that became forage for a neighborhood relationship and it built our neighborhood on Fifth Avenue. I've been here for 17 years and we're family and I think that you know that fish 
that I would bring off the beach had a lot to do with it. It's it's very it, it's a it's a very deep experience. Yeah, and if I could just play Monica for a little bit, <laughs> sorry, but I mean, I, it, wouldn't it be great if our students had those kinds of experiences? I mean, I, I love the kind of connections you were making between nature and community and aloneness and people and, yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> it was, that was a really interesting description, yeah. It was a great description of, of, of a great educational experience, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Well, you got to figure, this is only the second pilot. So I think that we can, we're going to be going so much deeper with this in the months ahead. And to me, I love kids. I love kids. And, you know, there are, there are going to be kids that are going to come say, hey, can I go fishing with you? I'm going to go, absolutely. You know, and, and so to me, we're going to be doing this program. I think what we stumbled into here is something that we can take so much farther. I, I can't wait to see where this thing goes in the coming year. I mean, you know, I, it's just, I can't see any end to it. So uh, we we are sort of coming to the end here. I we need to get a few more details, or I do. Um, how many schools are you ultimately working with? How many panels are in each school? And then what happens to those panels? Uh, we can and any other kind of detail. And please, other people, interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, friend. Well, we have uh, thirteen panels out at five different schools. And the idea is that before the end of this school year, we'll bring those panels together at a location where they'll all be displayed and we'll have an environmental education awareness event around the kids sharing with each other and with the community around what the process has been for them. Um, the other, the other detail so you, we just... You, you sound very open to how this is going. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Yeah, I mean, with, with all pilot projects, you know, you've got to be open to letting the thing have some of its own direction. Or you would never, you know, we would never have found what Kim wants to do at uh, Renaissance High School. I never would have thought of that. And so mm -hmm. we were able to incorporate her needs, and it taught us a whole new ballgame. And so... We're going to be working with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey program, which is an ocean ed education program here in Santa Cruz, and we're going to take all 13 of those panels and maybe one or two of mine and Taylor and other artists, and we're going to we're going to have a display so that people can understand that this is important to their kids, and we're going to we're going to use that to drive PR around the issue and around arts for our schools and around all of these things, and then what we've done at this point is taking it from 13 kids to about 80 kids, 70, 80. So what we're trying to do is scale it up so that we could make a national program. We want to see if it works. So we are completely open as to where this goes. And I was talking with Dan this afternoon that maybe we'll do a music thing, a music project next because music is math and music is language. So, you know, we're going to, it's going to be a discovery project for us as much as it is for the kids. Yeah, and if I could, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Scott. Yeah, go the, ahead. You know, the four by eight panels—they're rigid wooden, like four by eight sheets of plywood, or what are they? No, there's, no, they're set. They're, they're they're basically set panels, so they're very light construction plywood, but they're freestanding. So they've got legs, and they're basically wall panels that you would make for a movie set. Or okay, so I'm thinking, you know, you know so that basically. But you have to. You know, to, to transport one of those is going to be a, a bit of a, a an undertaking. You know, have you thought about making them out of fabric or Tyvek or something like the things that they put on the, the billboards where you can mail them cross country a little easier? Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, I just happen to have them, so I took what I had, and they look like blank canvases to me, and they're very light, which okay. is very cool. So it's really not that bad. I've been shipping them across country. If we're going to, if these were going to go to the Louvre. Paris, I think we probably have an issue, but since the, you know we really will want to drive this thing locally first while we're learning about it, it's not an issue. I managed to get cool. five of them stacked up on the roof rack of my Volvo station wagon. So yeah. just trying to. That sounds like an art project. All right, <laughs> Kelsey, any thoughts here at the end? 
Do you want a panel? What would you do on your panel? No, any any thoughts you have? <laughs> well, I, I do want a panel. That'd be really cool. I think my panel would be like half painting, half little metal fish. <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> We'll put we'll post this thing so you can follow it. Okay. Cool. And Kelsey, we're still waiting for that cooking show, uh, um, the diabetes cooking show, and the um, haven't forgotten. And <laughs> let's see. And how's the how's the environmental club going? Has that happened yet? Or uh, no, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so you can wait till you get to high school, maybe. But, okay. Yeah. Hey, Kelsey, here's one of here's one of my fish. Cool. What do you mean it's one of your fish? It's one of the fish that I made. That That's is really a, awesome. California black rockfish. This is fish. What's that made out of? It's made out of some steel I found. This was an old refrigerator that I found by the side of the road. <laughs> or a, no, I think it was ventilator duct. Yeah, well, Kelsey just got a welder a couple weeks ago, so I don't know what she's going to build with it first. We'll see what happens. A horse. <laughs> do, yes. Do, well, you know, and you know what we're looking forward to is say you could take an environmental issue. We could do this almost anywhere. We could do this with the pintail ducks or, you know, stuff that you got out there that, you know, that lights you up. And that's what I can't wait to take this nationally because, God, we could do this with anything. Great Thank ideas, you. great. Thank you so much. And and a little piece that Fred said a long time ago that I don't want to miss, um, or it comes up to mind again for me, is this what what I think we, the conversation with the maker community, is is the that when you're working with an artist, your 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 individual passions get made into this larger thing, um, and that's re a really interesting process, I think. Um, yeah, as long as you don't lose those individual passions. So it's an interesting dialogue to be having. Um, that's one of my thoughts. Uh, you guys uh, did never came on and told us much about Forge 3. I want to press you to, um, as this comes together, to involve us again and let us know how Forge 4 goes so we can maybe help with that national vision as well. well we just um, had so one just, more quick thing. Yeah. Is we just had development. Good is they've taken the, the piece that we did for Forge 3 and is now going to be permanently hung at a co-working space in Santa Cruz on the 17th of May. So we're going to do a major installation with the piece that these kids did. So actually, right. that piece of work is now, these kids ownership have ownership of a major piece of public work, which is what was pretty gratifying to us. So you did yeah, follow it. Yeah, we're hoping to record uh, <laughs> that event, and and we'll get you some footage of it. Cool. So thank you all for stopping in tonight and inspiring us once again with the arts and other things and making and connecting. Um, and uh, we'll uh, see you again next Wednesday, unless anybody wants to throw one last thought in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So um, we we are here every Wednesday evening at edtechtalk.com, and it's a channel of the World Bridges Network, and we thank Dave uh, Cormier and Jeff Lebo for um, setting up that network for us, and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Talk to you. Thanks. Thanks, Paul, and everybody.